Welcome to the Oil & Gas Future Forum, where we have gathered some of the industry's top minds to discuss the most pressing issues of our time. We are on the precipice of major change as we look ahead to a recovery after this historic and turbulent year. Throughout the course of the three panels today, we will explore the shifting cybersecurity landscape and the challenges and opportunities during and post-coronavirus. We'll look at the relevance of OPEC in the 2020s. And of course, we're going to consider one of the biggest challenges of our time, the energy transition. The first discussion of the day will be about OPEC's role in the 2020s. So I'd like to welcome all of our viewers and encourage you to use the chat as we wait for our speakers to dial in. We're starting the conversation today with a very big question. Will OPEC remain relevant in the 2020s? With the emergence of the United States as a major player in the global oil and gas market and following the current market crisis, the industry experts that we're <coughs> today will discuss the role of the organization of petroleum, petroleum exporting countries in the 2020s and beyond. We have some esteemed guests with us here to explore this subject today. We have Dr. Mohammed Sabban, who is a former senior advisor to the Saudi Energy Ministry. Dr. Sarah Vakshuri, who is the founder and president of SVB Energy International. Ole Hansen, who is the head of commodity strategy at Saxo Bank. And Herman Wang, who is the managing editor for OPEC and Middle East News at S&P Global Platts. So thank you all for being here with me today. I'm eager to hear your thoughts on this topic. So uh, let's just dive right in. Um, so obviously it's been an extraordinary year, a little bit of a turbulent year. Um, so Ole, if you could tell us in general, if you could give us a brief recap on the major oil price and uh, supply demand movements in 2020. Thank you very much, Carla, and thank you for having me. Um, well, what a year it's been. Uh, I think we already forgotten that uh, back in early January we were trading what was it, uh, around $72 on uh, Brent crude only to uh, collapse all the way down to $16 within the, within the next few months. It's obviously been a uh, dramatic uh, change in the, in the demand side that has, uh, has triggered this uh, major collapse in the oil price. And the pandemic is, is still with us and the pandemic was, uh, was a driver back then and, and it's still the one that is really preventing demand from recover back to, uh, to levels where we, where we were back in, back in January. So, um, it has been a year I think most people would like to uh, forget and uh, get through as soon as possible. But uh, obviously we are left with a market where there's still a, a, an imbalance between demand and supply. Uh, it is improving as we speak, but obviously with renewed uh, outbreaks as we're seeing here in Europe where I'm based and also in the US and elsewhere, the, uh, the, the, uh, the prolonged, we're going to see a prolonged uh, return or it's going to take a longer time before we get back to some kind of normality. And, and uh, obviously in, in a case like that, we have seen the importance of, of oil producers to act in unison uh, and try to step in and, and, uh, and, and arrest the, the hold. And that's really what we experienced with OPEC Plus back in April when they obviously faced with, a, uh, with a, this uh, horrible collapse uh, and, uh, and dwindling revenues had to do something. And, uh, and the production cut we saw back then was obviously laying, laying the foundation for the recovery. Right now, we're back into the uh, to the low 40s, and we're probably going to stick around these levels now for at least for a, for another few months before I, I think we eventually we'll move higher next year. But uh, as long as we don't have the vaccine, as long as uh, we're still forced to work from home uh, on a, on a regular and irregular basis, um, then then obviously it will have an impact. And have an impact. Then obviously the the I think the big question is really. Are we going to return to a demand growth in 2022 and beyond? How much have our, how have we as a global community changed our, our behavior uh, through, through this experience? And obviously we simply don't know yet. Are we all gonna jump back on the plane when we can because we want to visit friends and, and, and nice places? Or are we gonna stay at home? Are we gonna work from home? Are we gonna stay local when we go on holiday? So all these issues are, are some that obviously will uh, help determine the the outlook of the future, but uh, but for now, stuck in the 40s, and uh, that's probably where we're going to see it uh, for the for the coming months. 
Um, Herman, I'd actually, I'd like to hear your thoughts as well, because I know SNP Global Plus does a lot of reporting um, on this front. So, um, I mean, looking at the outlook, Ole has, you know, just said it will take some time to recover. That's kind of what we're expecting all around. But do you have any comments on the oil price movements and uh, supply demand movements? Yeah, sure. I mean, we just had a uh, monitoring committee meeting, the JMMC of the OPEC Plus Coalition. And, uh, you know, really, the only certain thing that we can say about the oil market is that there is uncertainty. And uh, that was the point that uh, the Saudi energy minister, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, he made that point uh, in his comments. A lot of people are looking at OPEC Plus uh, to extend their production cuts. They're, they're scheduled to taper at the end of the year by about a quarter to about 5.8 million barrels per day from 7.7. And there are a lot of questions about whether the market can absorb those barrels. Uh, you, we've got the, the return of Libya. We've got, uh, obviously, uncertainty about the second wave of the pandemic and all the lockdown measures that uh, many countries, uh, including right here in the UK, are, are reimposing on, on some communities. And that's uh, possibly going to hit energy demand. And, and, of course, we know that the uh, aviation is, industry still isn't back yet. So, uh, you know, a lot of uh, moving parts of the market uh, and a lot of questions about what OPEC Plus is going to do when they have that November 30th, December 1st meeting. Um, of course, we're sitting here, you know, five weeks, six weeks out from that actual meeting, which is a lifetime in the oil market. Lots of things can happen. Maybe we get progress towards a vaccine. We have the U.S. election, uh, you know, uh, that could impact uh, the course of the oil market. And, and of course, uh, you know, Libya uh, has shown itself to be a pretty unstable place. So even though it's production is returning, uh, that's not uh, guaranteed to last. And so, um, you know, I think that the approach right now for OPEC Plus is to kind of wait and see, see what the market indicators are like uh, close to that November 30th, December 1st meeting. But I think the expectation is, and, and there's a growing realization by many of the delegates within, but, but by, no means, by no means all of them, um, that if prices remain in this low 40s level as we head to that November 30th, December 1st meeting, uh, perhaps something needs to be done and, and whether that's extending the cuts or, or uh, uh, you know, the devil will be in the details on, on how, how long they extend those cuts and uh, you know, how they divvy up any, any new quotas and how they accommodate the return of Libya. If, if Libya is sustained, um, you know, those are all questions that the oil market will be looking at. So, um, I mean, I guess we've touched on this a little bit already, but um, how would each of you describe OPEC's role at present? So, uh, Dr. Saban, if we can start with you, uh, how would you describe OPEC's role in the global oil market right now? Thank you for inviting me uh, to participate. Uh, first of all, OPEC and OPEC Plus are doing a great job to the oil market as far as the OPEC Plus agreement. I know there are some members who are not abiding by the uh, commitments, their commitments, but they have promised to compensate in the coming month before the end of the year. Having said that, I think the role of OPEC Plus will continue to be crucial during this crisis. This crisis uh, uh, has been a surprise to OPEC. They were on the uh, course of uh, enjoying high oil prices. And then we found that prices went down to as low as $16 per barrel. But uh, having said that, I think the, uh, the notion that uh, this crisis will change the uh, consumer behavior, I don't think this will happen unless this crisis of, crisis of uh, COVID-19 continue for two or three years, uh, God forbidden. But uh, if, if, I mean, a few months or one year will not change the behavior. I know that uh, companies uh, are willing to uh, communicate uh, by internet, etc. but still the same as for education. I have my children, they are suffering from <laughs> being at home and uh, uh, learning from the uh, sets, the different uh, sets that they have. But anyway, in all cases, I think 
uh, OPEC the role will continue to be very important. Uh, Saudi Arabian leadership, along with Russia, is driving the uh, OPEC plus boat to the uh, safe side. Uh, however, I think the uncertainties evolving the demand is going to continue with us for some time, especially if there is no vaccine. But if there is a vaccine in the, in the uh, world economy, then definitely this will help uh, alleviate or mitigate some of the uh, weaknesses of the demand for oil. Uh, so in the short term, I don't think we have a lasting impact. Uh, well, the Economist, the um, respected uh, magazine, they said that, well, this, this crisis has brought the um, uh, demand for oil to its peak. I do not agree with that. This is a short term crisis. And once, as we, say, we saw, once we reopen economies, we have seen that um, demand start to pick up, especially in China. Uh, of course, um, the second wave has stopped this uh, recovery, a gradual recovery in demand from materializing uh, to a level where we can enjoy the the pre pre COVID nineteen uh, levels. Um, to sum up, I think the role of OPEC in the coming month will continue to be crucial. The cooperation, the the OPEC plus agreement is a historical agreement, uh, as far as the numbers of the uh, the members, as far as the quantity of production cut. As far as the countries who did not join the agreement, like the United States, um, uh, Norway, uh, Brazil, etc., they are more or less uh, part of the agreement unofficially by limiting uh, voluntary or involuntary their production, uh, oil production. So I think this will continue. And uh, those who are violating their commitments will, uh, will, uh, will know that if they continue violating, this will not stop any other uh, members from uh, doing the same. And then we'll have a free for all market. And this could repeat uh, the, uh, uh, the March price war, which nobody uh, can accept because it is a, a loss-loss uh, game. It is not a win-win game. So everybody needs to look at that and give more consideration. And as far as the latest statistics, we have seen that it is only six countries out of the, the whole OPEC Plus uh, uh, members who are abiding by uh, the agreement, but with the uh, with the uh, seriousness of Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, Minister of uh, Oil, uh, Minister of Energy of Saudi Arabia, and uh, Minister Novak, in leading uh, the uh, coalition, I think we will gradually go back to the uh, close to the adherence by all countries. Uh, I know that uh, Libya is uh, something that is disturbing to OPEC plus, but this is a reality and they need to adapt to it. And we don't know what will happen uh, if um, President uh, Trump conti uh, continue for a sec second term or... Election. We'll touch on the U.S. election um, a little bit later. Okay. In Okay, so, so, so I'll stop here. <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank yeah. you. No, but thank you for your comments, I, Dr. Vakshuri. Um, how would you describe OPEC's role at present and uh, in the upcoming the next few months? I so I, um, it's um, the other uh, panelists alluded uh, to different aspects of the OPEC importance. Uh, 
One thing that is very important, the key word of these days market is uncertainty, as Herman mentioned. So we do have a significant uncertainty when it comes to demand side. So we do not know when exactly the demand is going to recover, how fast or if there are any threats to demand going back again to where we had a significant global lockdowns. But what is the significance of OPEC, especially at the moment and now that we have a demand uncertainty is that OPEC is giving a certainty cer some sort of certainty on the supply side uh, there are uh, different factors we could mention Libya um, and there are other issues that we could look into that they could create a supply certainty but OPEC and uh, non uh, the OPEC plus uh, overall they are uh, producing a majority of the supply in the market so having them uh, together uh, deciding on how much should be their production that gives a certainty in the market and we experienced back in uh, march then when the opec plus failed to agree uh, on a production cut or continue uh, uh, to continue their um, uh, previous cut the market entered into a chaos and then we had a free market that everyone was trying to uh, produce at maximum level we had all the um, uh, storage tanks that they were uh, filled uh, up to their top and then we start seeing the collapse of oil prices even um, occasionally to uh, negative uh, for certain uh, oil contracts. So it's very important and especially at this point for the OPEC and uh, OPEC plus generally uh, it's very uh, as mentioned it was a historical deal but most uh, historical part of OPEC plus is that Russia is now uh, on the same table with the OPEC and they're trying to control their uh, prices uh, their their production. So this is very significant and important, especially at this time. Uh, we did back in May, we did an extensive um, discussions and uh, uh, work you know, uh, interviews with most of the US shell producers. And we asked all of them if there is any possibility that at some point they would uh, consider to have certain uh, amount of voluntary production cut. Um, at the end of the day, if um, it's, it was and it is in their benefit, um, at the time at the times that prices are collapsing to have certain amount of uh, production cut the answer from all of them was that they would never uh, going to accept a voluntary production cut because their business model is simply different they are not like opec uh, plus countries that the minister would command a certain amount of production, but they are all private companies that they look into uh, their own commitment and their only commitment is to their shareholders and their balance sheets. So we would not ever, uh, could not imagine that we could see a voluntary cut uh, from let's say shell producers, which are uh, responsible for the major supply growth in the market for the past uh, few years. So I would say that especially at the time like this, that we have significant uncertainty, OPEC plus uh, has a very important role. The other thing that I would like to mention is the uh, the impact of uh, OPEC and especially uh, I would say Saudi and Russian are very very concerned and very careful about how they are designing their messages uh, and how they are um, I would say use certain keywords to announce their decisions is very important because uh, Prince Abdelaziz of Saudi Arabia is not only uh, communicating with a physical market which is actual cut uh, of uh, physical supply in the market but he's also communicating with the traders but in, the, uh, in a paper market the way he's uh, threatening uh, the uh, oil uh, paper market or let's say uh, uh, putting uh, fear in their uh, hearts and minds to uh, bet against uh, OPEC or how he's carefully designing his uh, messages is very crucial because um, we know that uh, Ole might uh, tell us more, but most of the traders are using algorithms and big data programs to do trading uh, with them. And those keywords that um, uh, especially uh, Russian and Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabian oil ministers are using are very crucial in converting those into, let's say, a certain market. I will make a few quick examples like uh, Prince Abdelaziz in his uh, last remark, the introduction, uh, the introdu introductory statement in the uh, last uh, OPEC meeting, he used three uh, keywords. 
predictable, uh, he, OPEC wants to have a predictable uh, market. They are going to be proactive in to make sure that the market is going to be as uh, certain and uh, calm market. So all these keywords are very important for the mind of algorithm when it's uh, looking into the future prices, which ultimately have um, uh, impact on the uh, today's spot prices. And there are so many other examples that how Saudi uh, uh, oil minister and Russian oil minister carefully designed the messages in terms of keywords and uh, the literature they're announcing. Uh, the other big example was when they uh, announced that they were going both Russia and Saudi Arabia at about 500,000 barrels each one uh, oil to the market they made sure that they are announcing that this is going to be used domestically uh, for their own domestic use at the end of the day it was adding to the whole uh, pot of supply but this was very uh, important that how they assured the market that this additional oil is not going to be exported so I would say that very uh, important role uh, OPEC is uh, holding at the current moment yeah, that's definitely an interesting take, especially kind of the detailed analysis on from the trading side. I actually wonder, um, Ole, do you have anything to add to that or do you have any comment on that? Because I, I think that's fascinating. Well, I think it is, uh, it, it's, it's a very good point that they made uh, because obviously uh, the, the supply and demand balancing doesn't change on an hour to hour basis, but obviously the market does and the market does really react to to technical developments, uh, to break out, to momentum, and and any span in the works that can kind of offset that uh, the, the, those movements is obviously something that that can help further stabilize the market. So after that OPEC meeting and that comment, we did see the market. Uh, that was basically when the Brent made it back above forty dollars after having was looking and not staring at the abyss, but at least was uh, starting to get troubled by the by the renewed uh, coronavirus cases around the world. So it did have an impact. And uh, and uh, yes, we, we do watch these uh, data on a weekly basis because obviously all the speculative data because market thrives on data and uh, the more we know, the the, the, the more uh, reaction the market can, can take to it. So, so taking out some of these uh, so some of these spikes, uh, peaks and throws uh, through through verbal intervention is uh, is obviously quite try helping to create some some stability and uh, and OP Plus is I think uh, uh, as was said earlier has done a sterling job uh, in the past few months obviously coming out of a, a very very short lived price war now to uh, to support in the market and that that role is going to be even more important going forward because now we have a. Now we have a, a demand which is slowly coming back, but then we also have a massive amount of spare capacity that needs to come back into the market. And how they manage it, how they manage that uh, without upsetting each other and without upsetting the market, that's obviously going to be a key into 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if I could just chime in here. I, I think this, uh, this notion of talking to traders is something that uh, OPEC has, uh, I don't know if embraced is the right word, but they're certainly a lot more open to talking to traders now. And, I remember I spoke with Mohammed Barkindo, the, the Secretary General of OPEC, um, last year just about this uh, topic. And, uh, you know, he said he was meeting with hedge fund uh, managers and, and money managers. And, uh, you know, in his words, he said, you know, sometimes these, these traders, they speak almost like a foreign language, you know. And so uh, it was an effort on the part of OPEC, these producers, to try and understand uh, what motivates them. Uh, I mean, I think it could be argued that uh, even with all this outreach that uh, – you know, OPEC uh, just by its very nature is more, it's a reactive organization. It's, it's a, even as much as uh, Prince Abdul Aziz might want OPEC to be proactive, um, the reality is, is trying to politically get these 13 countries and then you, then you add another 10 non-OPEC in the OPEC plus alliance, uh, trying to get all these 23 countries on the same page. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to do, let alone be proactive in the market uh, and try to get ahead of some of these uh, uh, these these money market uh, these money trades uh, that are that are being made in the market. We've discussed kind of OPEC's role at the moment, um, what OPEC is really doing in the oil and gas market right now. But um, obviously, the industry is shifting quite rapidly um, in many different ways. Uh, we could talk about energy transition. We can talk about geopolitical movements, and obviously, the pandemic has have had has had its own impact. So, in its current form, as we've defined it. Um, do you think OPEC is relevant in what looks like it will be a vastly different future for the oil and gas industry? Um, and I think I'd like to start with Dr. Saban. So do you think OPEC will be relevant in a future that is going to look different than the market does today? If you are speaking about the 2020s, 
OPEC will continue to be relevant. I understand that there is an energy transition because of the uh, structural change on the demand side and on the supply side. However, this will not be materializing before the uh, uh, 2030s. So I think during the 2020s, OPEC will continue to uh, try to stabilize oil market and will continue with its role. But even, even in the 30s, uh, I think to, uh, OPEC will have some role to play, especially if some of the uh, objectives of shifting to renewables and try to get away from oil, as uh, been said by the IEA, unfortunately. Uh, uh, still, oil, uh, OPEC will have some role in the market, uh, even though it is going to be diminished. I think uh, the problem with the uh, current transition is that it is an artificial transition. We all know that. Uh, science of climate change is not, uh, I mean, the jury is still out with regard to many issues in climate change, but we are hurrying and trying to uh, isolate some of the GHG gases, uh, try to uh, pick only CO2, aside from uh, methane, nitrous oxide, and other greenhouse gases. And not only that, but also picking uh, fossil fuel from all other sectors of uh, the uh, economic sectors that emit uh, greenhouse gases. So I think with this selectivity that we have seen, uh, oil will be hit hard, not because of the uh, protecting the environment, but because of the uh, hidden objectives uh, in the West to fight oil, imported oil. And I remember here uh, Henry Kissinger in the 70s after the um, oil boycott in 1973, he said, we will come to the day where the Arabs will drink their, their oil. And I think we are gradually coming to this. And unfortunately, some of us are not realizing that this is becoming reality. So I think this economic, I mean, energy transition, even though I have nothing against renewables, nothing against uh, diversifying energy uh, sources, but when the, you are not leveling the playing field and giving subsidies uh, to renewables, and not only renewables, subsidies to coal, which emits more greenhouse gases than oil and, uh, and gas, uh, then definitely we see, start to see a big question. Why are we doing that? Are we protecting the environment? And uh, once I was with the uh, German minister and I told him, you are still subsidizing uh, coal industry. He said, yes, there are hundreds of thousands of German workers who work in, in the coal industry. And I told him, you know that all of the Saudi labor force are working for the oil industry. And so who's going to complain, uh, us, Saudi Arabia or Germany? So we ended the, the discussion there, but he admitted that we will be hit hard as uh, an oil exporting countries because of this bias agreement. And not only that, but also we see that once we talk about carbon taxes, it is basically, um, it ends up to be gasoline tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is not according to the carbon content. So there are some weaknesses in the um, Paris Agreement, which tend to be 
uh, an energy agreement. It is not a greenhouse gas agreement. Mm -hmm. If you look at the uh, UNFCC uh, convention, something that we uh, I had the honor to negotiate, it is calling for a comprehensive approach that include not only uh, CO2, but all other greenhouse gases, and not only energy sector, but all economic sectors, including forest. Deforestation is a major problem for not absorbing CO2. But anyway, this is a very long discussion, but I want to, to say that uh, we are seriously bothered and worried about the intent of the uh, climate um, agreements that is going not only in the West, but spreading everywhere. Uh, and many uh, oil importing countries are uh, adopting certain policies and measures that will shift them from oil to other, uh, other uh, sources of energy. Well, I mean, shifting away from intent, though, looking at OPEC as an organization that manages supply and demand for oil, um, I, I, I'm curious to hear, I mean, will it be able to survive in an environment where um, oil is maybe not the main uh, or, or major resource for fuel as a fuel? Um, so uh, I guess, Herman, if I can pose that question to you, um, is OPEC ready to transform into a role um, that can coexist with a different energy mix? Yeah, thanks, Carla. I mean, you know, I think OPEC, uh, well, well, they released their world oil outlook uh, the other week. And uh, uh, it was interesting in that uh, it was for the first time that OPEC acknowledged that the possibility of peak demand might be out there. Now, they projected it out to 2040 to 2045. So uh, still several decades off, you know, and obviously we see that, uh, you know, in stark contrast with the likes of BP and uh, Shell and some of the other oil majors that are predicting a much faster energy transition. Now, now obviously there are, there are vested interests on both sides uh, of those outlooks. But, uh, you know, I think OPEC has for the longest time um, said that even in a declining market, even if this idea of peak demand were to happen, uh, they've got the lowest cost of production, and so they really will be the last pr last producer standing in this world. I think this will, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think it'll, it'll no doubt change some of the dynamics within OPEC, and uh, uh, you know, I think you're seeing some of that, uh, even some of that early early trends kind of play out now, where as they try to manage the situation now, where um, and perhaps this pandemic is, is a preview of that kind of uh, role that OPEC may play in a declining market, because we've obviously seen a market shock and demand um, plummet, uh, especially early in the first and the second quarter of this year. Uh, and now how they try to manage that going forward uh, is, uh, is an open question. And that kind of sets them up for the, the coming decades, I think. Um, you know, in my view, uh, you know, if the oil market declines, but OPEC is stands to gain market share because of its low cost structure, I think that makes a lot of the more bilateral agreements and the bilateral talks with some of their major buyers, whether that's China, whether that's India, uh, you know, whether that's with even the U.S. You know, the U.S. has its own uh, obviously robust shale oil and a conventional oil uh, industry. Um, but, you know, in a, in a peak demand scenario where, where uh, investment may be hard to come by, you know, we may see some of that uh, that, that shale production peak and, and plateau and then eventually fall off. And, and standing there will be these low cost OPEC producers in the Middle East there to try and capture that market share if it's still there. Um, so I think this is gonna place a, a, an important premium on these bilateral talks, uh, these bilateral relations going forward uh, as, uh, as, these, uh, as the demand uh, evolves. Uh, Dr. Vekshuri, do you have any thoughts on the topic? I think uh, something that is very important to consider uh, when we are talking about uh, climate change issues, energy transition, and peak oil is that the quality of oil also matters a lot. And uh, I really understand when Dr. Saban says that the uh, OPEC uh, 
or oil producers uh, in the Middle East are concerned about these climate change uh, discussions because it seems that um, the first um, target of all these uh, uh, climate change and energy transition uh, topics is black oil, which is mostly a black or heavy oil that is mostly produced in uh, in the uh, Middle East and OPEC uh, producers are, are producing uh, them. What Herman said is also very valid that the um, OPEC producers are producing the lowest cost or cheapest oil in the world. And if we are living in a world that the oil prices are very low, the, the last barrel would come out, let's say Saudi Arabia because the prices of oil is very low. But the regulations on uh, all the regulations, uh, the climate change regulations are set in a way that the peak oil for heavy and black oil is reaching way faster than light oil that is produced in the United States, let's say, or uh, outside of the uh, OPEC country. So that's, uh, I think, a nuance um, that I want to add to this discussion. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Ole, anything to add from your side? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Then we'll move on to the next question. Um, I, oh, wait, one second. Uh, there you go. Sorry, Dr. Stefan, you're on mute. Damn. Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely. There are two things. They, uh, our colleagues talked about the low cost production uh, of oil in the Middle East. That's true. But we know that OPEC, in general, they are the residual supplier. That means that all other nations who are importing uh, oil will take their imports from all other areas and countries aside from OPEC. So OPEC also will be penalized from that point of view. Secondly, we forgot about the technological progress that the world is uh, watching these days. Who, 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 have, who could have imagined that the cost of producing one barrel of shell has dropped from more than $80 per barrel to less than $35 per barrel? And this will continue. And I wouldn't be wondered if the, the gap between conventional and non-conventional oil start to narrow and getting closer and closer from each other. So that is part of it. And you, we are living in an artificial world where taxes on oil products will continue to increase over time under the pretext of protecting climate while other uh, sources of energy will enjoy either subsidy or tax relief. So the, the, the treatment is not equal and not fair. And I remember I used to be the head of Saudi delegation to the UNFCC, Climate Change uh, United Nations Negotiation Committees. And we faced a lot of fight against oil and and i remember still remember uh when president obama took the floor in copenhagen and he said that climate change negotiations will offer us an opportunity to reduce our oil imports and i raised my flag and i told him mr president we are in a globalization do you think that what you are saying will serve the global, globalization? And they said, no, but we are looking for our interests. Anyway, this is an, another issue, but still we are worried about these uh, uh, distortions in the market, these unfair and equal uh, treatment of oil vis-a-vis -vis other sources of energy that will hurt hard oil industry and regardless of the oil, co the cost of uh, barrel of oil, and regardless of who to take your barrel from, the world will come to uh, the uh, reality that there will be a surplus in supply, and there will be a competition as far as prices, 
and demand is diminishing. And that is really serious to us and to many oil producing countries. Sorry to take the long. No, you bring up some interesting points and um, I'll, I'll take this as kind of a segue into talking a little bit about the United States. Obviously, um, we're heading into an election in November. Um, do I, I would like to know, at least first from Dr. Vakshuri, because you are based in the U.S., um, do you expect the results of the U.S. election to impact global trade um, and in turn OPEC? Yes, uh, of course. That uh, that's going to be one of the major impacts uh, of the U.S. Uh, election uh, on the global uh, energy market. Because um, obviously, if you're going to, if we would have a President Biden uh, in the White House, we are going to expect that the peak oil, especially peak heavy oil demand, to reach way faster than if we had uh, President Trump uh, in the White House. And um, this is going to have, yes, significant impact on the regulations because especially if the uh, Congress, uh, the next Congress is majority uh, dominated by uh, Democrats, then the, the, the climate change regulations, all these uh, carbon trade and taxes that uh, Dr. Saban uh, mentioned are going to go uh, implemented and moved way faster in, uh, in the United States because um, in terms of regulations, U.S. is still behind uh, Europe in terms of implementing regulations, but that does not mean that the whole country is behind uh, in the whole process uh, of moving forward. So imagine if there is just uh, a regulation inside the United States that the um, octane of gasoline should move, uh, like let's say one or two degree uh, higher, just a slightly above uh, what it is today. Obviously the demand for gasoline uh, would um, peak in US way faster and people would move uh, quicker inside the United States uh, toward uh, the electric, uh, the EVs, uh, which uh, is a huge market for driving in the world. So I would say yes, and the U.S. election is going to have a significant impact on the uh, global uh, climate change uh, uh, speed, uh, that in terms of regulations uh, and taxes and the speed that they're going and also about um, the, the peak, peak oil demand. Something that I would like to uh, add to what Dr. Saban mentioned uh, is that there is no uh, really clean way of producing energy. And... Um, if let's say I would like to make, uh, make an example of uh, wind uh, energy, there is uh, all these discussions in US about the uh, when these uh, wind uh, turbine blades are uh, retired. There are massive graveyards for this wind blade uh, uh, turbine, which are, it's, it takes a lot of process and significant amount of energy to recycle them. So uh, there is not really any clean way of producing energy. And um, again, all these uh, climate change discussions are solely focusing on carbon, uh, carbon uh, emissions. So there are many other uh, issues that uh, it's important to be considered when we are talking about the impact of process of uh, energy production and uh, uh, pro uh, the whole process uh, of this uh, huge industry and the uh, climate change. Yeah, definitely. And um, I guess next time I'll invite you guys for an energy transition talk because we're hearing so many <laughs> interesting points and I'd love to go even further into that. Um, but I am going to keep us on track. Um, Ole, if you could comment, I mean, for the U.S. election, do you expect it to impact OPEC and the oil markets in general? If so, how? Well, obviously, we know, we know what we have now, uh, and the markets right now is trying to speculate what what will what we will have uh, if we do get a Biden win. Which obviously the uh, the polls are pointing towards at this stage. Um, I think the initial reaction in the market the market is, is, is setting itself up for a Biden win, and uh, and and one with more regulatory, uh, a stronger regulatory environment, uh, which potentially will will slow the the recovery in the, in the U.S. Uh, oil oil field. But at the same time, it may also just have a 
in a, from a from a, a growth perspective a negative impact because it could send prices higher after after November November three um, and and that obviously is, is counterproductive at, at this stage where we at this stage where we don't need more production we need uh, just stable production so um, it's going to be interesting to see the uh, see over the uh, over the, the coming years but uh, I'm just interesting uh, I saw today there was some speculation about well what what if we do have a Biden win will OPEC then think they can they can uh, they can force through the or they can come through with their production uh, increase in January because U.S. production will uh, will will be 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 hampered. That's probably an too early assumption. But uh, but one thing's for sure: we will see uh, continued volatility in the oil market, especially with the Biden win and, and the market trying to adjust to uh, to what's uh, what what it will bring. But I think overall, U.S. production is. It's going to grow again from here, but the, we can just see this, the, the whole climate discussion is also changing investors' perception. So, so countries where it's, it's government run, they don't have, they, they're not in the same straitjacket as U.S. producers. And we're seeing all these mergers right now occurring in the U.S. shale patch because, they are, because the, the, the access to finance is, is going to be, be, uh, be, be more difficult going forward. And, and that in itself could potentially just slow the, the recovery in U.S. oil growth. And, and if we assume that we're going to return to, to trend growth, at least for a number of years, then obviously that will leave more space for, for, for OPEC and, and some of the OPEC plus producers. Uh, Herman, do you have anything to add? Yeah, if I could just jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think it's what's interesting is, uh, uh, you know, this idea of uh, OPEC uh, uh, and their politics with with Trump, uh, and we saw that uh, you know earlier uh, last couple of years that you have Trump tweeting at OPEC, warning them about high oil, oil prices and and warning them not to cut production too much, and you know just talking with some delegates in OPEC, you know those those tweets uh, at OPEC weren't 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 really welcomed by OPEC this uh, this interference in their affairs and and it really kind of stirred up a lot of their their meetings. Um, now then, then we had the price war uh, back in uh, April, and then Trump uh, took the opposite tack, and he got the OPEC and Russia back together to put a floor under prices with this production cut and forge this agreement. So it's been a very activist role that uh, that Trump has played with OPEC. If we see a Biden win, you know, uh, I, I would not expect that kind of activist role by a Biden administration. But but you know, at, on the same token, though, let's be real. You know, the the relations between the U.S. And, and Saudi Arabia and other key members of OPEC uh, are still going to be largely based on oil diplomacy. You know, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco owns the Motiva refinery, the largest refinery in the U.S. We see a lot of Saudi crude. Uh, obviously, that fluctuates with uh, shale oil production, but a lot of Saudi crude goes to the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of Iraqi crude goes to the Gulf of Mexico. We see Nigerian crude sometimes going to the east coast of the U.S., uh, competing in some cases against shale oil. But uh, you know, these, these trade flows are not going to stop just because of a Biden uh, presidency. And it's, it's going to be based on arbitrage economics. And so, uh, you know, to uh, Mr. El Saban's point, uh, you know, we live in a globalized environment. It's a global oil market. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, anything that uh, causes the, the price of oil to, to wobble is going to impact uh, consumers and producers worldwide in some way. So, you know, I expect that there will be a lot more back channel talks between uh, Biden and, and members of OPEC on oil policy it won't be as maybe assertive as, as Trump has been. And the tenor of those talks may be different and the content of those talks may be different, but um, there's not gonna be a stopping of oil diplomacy, uh, even with a change in administration, uh, in my view. Okay, and um, obviously we've talked about OPEC plus, we've talked about kind of the, um, the kind of coalition to stabilize oil prices. Um, but we have seen some reluctance in the past uh, from Russia to cut production. So um, I would like to know, I guess, I think starting with um, Ole, do you see this alliance further extending in the future? Um, and if so, why? Why not? I think it will. Um... Uh, because it, we, we've seen the success that, it, that they've had, and they've seen the uh, the need for two of the world's biggest producers to uh, to to uh, sing from the same same sheet. Uh, so I think that will uh, will continue over the over the coming periods. And and again, I, I think it's absolutely uh, important what Herman said that we've gone we've gone from U.S. being obstructive to uh, to uh, to higher prices to now them being being on the same same page as well because because of the massive oil industry in the U.S. But perhaps not as as forcefully in the in on the Biden administration, but at least we are. There are the, the three major 
producers are all in unison in trying to to uh, support the prices. Uh, and and with that in mind, I think Russia will continue to uh, to play ball and uh, continue to stay on on board. Obviously, it's slightly difficult for them sometimes to direct the individual producers to do what they what they're instructed to do. But uh, they've seen the success of the uh, this plan, and uh, I see no reason why they shouldn't continue that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take this next to Dr. Saban. You've been very positive about the OPEC Plus Alliance, so um, I have a feeling I already know your answer. But um, do you think the OPEC Plus Alliance will extend in the future? It should. I mean, uh, theoretically, they have no other alternatives but to cooperate because the alternative is worse. And we have noticed that when the big fight between Russia and Saudi Arabia back in March, and the result of that, uh, of a price war that was ignited by Russia when they went to the media and they said, we will produce at maximum and there is no agreement and we are not part of the coalition. And that motivated Saudi Arabia to react by increasing its production and then we saw what what happened but uh, let me let me comment you didn't give me a chance to comment on the election whether uh, president trump or biden will win president trump i like his uh, approach being a businessman he said as far as he withdraw from paris climate agreement we all know that and he he said that i wouldn't sac sacrifice our oil and gas and coal uh, for the sake of an uncertain sign. So he, if, if President Trump win a second term, then climate efforts will be dead. I mentioned it to many worldwide media that uh, once President Trump be re-elected, then you will never see climate debate continue. And even if it continues, there will be no agreement. There is no financing. The major emitter in the world will not be part of it. So it will be killed. And to be honest with you, that's good news for Saudi Arabia and many oil producing countries. I know the Europeans would hate that. And that's why they are pushing to get uh, Biden to be the president, next president. Secondly, uh, as far as the fungibility that we talked about, this is true. And that is what, what worries us also, because when you favor some markets to get your oil from at the uh, expense of others, then definite, definitely this will result in um, keeping OPEC uh, somehow vulnerable to uh, not buying their oil, even though China, as you said, India, but China and India and others are also taking climate measures into consideration. Uh, coal is a major source of energy in China and India. Uh, they are not touching that, but they are imposing some taxes on oil products. Again, this is another bias in the international discussion. And I remember I was also part of the Saudi delegation to WTO, and there was a huge resistance not to include oil in the rules of the WTO. So uh, there is some disturbances here and there that affect developing countries affect oil exporting developing countries. And I think we, at the end of the day, we will pay the price. One, one issue that we raised during climate negotiation that we, we seek compensation because of these discriminatory uh, actions and policies and measures. And they say, no, Saudi Arabia cannot be compensated. Anyway, that's a long, long, long issue. So to take but, you back to um, the original question about OPEC Plus, <laughs> do you see? Okay. Do you OPEC, see no, this is this is this is very important for OPEC Plus. Come on, OPEC Plus will continue to survive because this is a major 
uh, interest to all OPEC plus member countries. Thank you. Um, Herman, your perspective? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think uh, just uh, it's a, it's a, it's it's a complicated world we live in, I guess, and and there are many moving parts to this. You know, climate change uh, regulations are certainly going to play a role in the oil market going forward, and this is something that OPEC Plus uh, is going to have to adjust to. And and uh, in this world, you know, this this idea of Russia cooperation with uh, OPEC Plus, uh, you know. It's it's uh, you know as much as uh, OPEC likes to talk about it as a as a Catholic marriage a, per, a permanent deal you know I think uh, um, we've seen evidence that uh, there are limits to that uh, we saw that back in March when they couldn't agree on a path forward and we had the um, market share battle that broke out in April that caused that, that exacerbated the market crash um, you know maybe in some ways that that was actually a tough lesson uh, learned for everybody and uh, uh, that it, it really did end up bringing them back to the table um, with the help of President Trump um, because they saw the impact on prices. And, and you know, in, in some, some ways it was a Saudi Ramco and Saudi Arabia's way of showing their market strength. Uh, they could get up to 12 million barrels per day, uh, 12 and a half perhaps. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have this ability to quickly ramp up their production. Uh, and so uh, that that is a strength of Saudi Arabia, and that that's what makes it the the kingpin of OPEC. Uh, and I think that was something that Russia had to recognize and and, and come back to the table. Now you know we're seeing now that the, as as the situation goes to the end of the year, where the cuts are scheduled to taper, and uh, we know that several countries, not just Russia, but several other countries within OPEC, want to raise their production. They're they're tired of reining in their production, and uh, but uh, you know it's it's a you know they've got to be cautious, right? So. Uh, you know, this is why I said that, you know, earlier in the talk that getting all 23 countries on the same page is, is no easy task. And, and uh, you know, even though uh, the market might be saying one thing, the, the market indicators might be saying one thing, uh, the geopolitics might be saying another thing, and uh, the, the uh, domestic concerns of each of these countries might be saying a different thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it'll be interesting going forward to see what they do with these cuts. And, and, and maybe that'll be the ultimate test of how long Russia uh, uh, stays along. You know, I, th I think Russia does see value in cooperating with OPEC. And, uh, you know, let, let's also be uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that even if they do taper down to 5.8 million barrels per day, that's the largest cut, uh, you know, beyond uh, the, the initial 9.7 and the 7.7. But that's still bigger than any other cuts that they've done in the previous four years of cooperation. Uh, so it's huge, still a huge deal. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there, there are reasons for this uh, cooperation to continue. Uh, but as with, uh, you know, all negotiations, sometimes there are concessions that need to be made. And so that, that really is the, the, what we're watching at that November 30th, December 1st meeting. Uh, and uh, just finally, Dr. Vekshuri, anything that you'd like to add? Something that i like to add is that, yes, Russia sees value in cooperating with OPEC Plus and at least for what we can see for the next uh, year or so, there has been an agreement which assures the market of this uh, cooperation. When the OPEC Plus have gave the market a production cut until 2021, this is also a signal or an indication that uh, Russia is on the same page with the OPEC uh, and the rest of the OPEC Plus countries. But something that um, we can never be sure, we can never say never uh, in the energy industry, and we cannot be sure that how future could look like. There are some uh, buts or some um, uh, issues that OPEC, uh, Russia is not exactly in the same situation as OPEC is. For instance, the role of uh, oil and oil prices in Russian economy is not as significant as it is for the rest of the uh, OPEC uh, members. And also the other issue is the Russian producers. So as of, uh, as of now, the current cooperation with OPEC is in favor of Russian producers, which ultimately they have to cut back their production. But we don't know that if there might be situations or scenarios in the future that the producers would not simply agree to cut back their production, the Russian producers. So what I would say is that this is a very good indication that OPEC Plus tried to give a long-term production cut plan. It doesn't matter if they would go month to month based on that production plan because they are going to meet and they are going to balance the production with realities of the market. But again, going back to what I said earlier into our meeting, you're trying to give signals to 
trade to the traders to the physical market and to the future prices that uh, at least until 2021 russia is determined to be on the same table with the opec and on the same page if we don't have any sudden or new uh, event that no one could expect it okay thank you i mean that's all the time that we have we've actually gone a little bit over time so i appreciate um all of you joining us and giving uh, your insight into this topic and um, to those in the audience who are sharing questions through the chat, we do not have time to take questions, but we will share them with the speakers and post the answers on our website and social media. So uh, make sure to check in later um, and stay tuned for our next session on shifts in cybersecurity with Saudi Ramco's Chief Information Security Officer after a short break to bring our guests into the webinar. Uh, thank you to our panel for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate you giving your time. The coronavirus pandemic has grounded people across industries, leaving them working from home and unable to travel or commute. For oil and gas companies, which have extensive digital and physical assets, questions of cybersecurity are constantly arising as cyber threats shift and as they increasingly look to digital technology as a new solution to old problems. We have a true expert with us today to assess the shifting cybersecurity landscape. Saudi Ramco's Chief Information Security Officer, Khaled Al Harbi, is here to discuss the shifts in cybersecurity during and after the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you for joining me today, Khaled. Thank you. Uh, we're very excited to, you know, to, to hear more about this. It's obviously an interesting subject that's important to all um, oil and gas producers and you know, on the scale of Saudi Ramco. Um, it, it will be fascinating to, to see your perspective. So uh, let's just dive right into the questions. Um, so starting with, you know, the start of the pandemic. So when the pandemic started and there was this, you know, start of a market crisis, what were the biggest concerns for you in terms of cybersecurity? You know, and, and how did you manage those concerns? Okay, I, I think uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic introduced unparalleled challenges to organizations, especially organizations that uh, depended on the perimeters for securing their infrastructure. Uh, the new pandemic uh, requiring social distancing and forcing em employees to work from home meant that the, 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 uh, the threat landscape is actually going outside. Your uh, surface is expanding. Uh, so you had to actually manage that uh, risk uh, in order for you to ensure that the environment remains cyber resilience in face of uh, this pandemic. Uh, luckily, in Saudi Aramco, we have a very strong foundation uh, for uh, a resilient and digital ready infrastructure that enabled us to securely avail these services to our employees without impacting uh, the business. Uh, we actually had to uh, partner uh, with our uh, IT organizations to ensure that we uh, any service that is availed to employees to work from home went through uh, very rigorous risk uh, assessment uh, processes in order for us to identify the risk and uh, introduce any controls to mitigate uh, such that uh, such risk another aspect that was actually introduced part of the covid 19 is that cyber attacks are usually opportunistic and whenever a, 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 a big event such as this uh, is happening around the world, uh, attackers actually leverage this to begin uh, building their attacks. And we, what we've seen is that phishing attacks, which uh, still remains to be the number one uh, tar attack vector, shifted in the use of COVID-19 as a theme for uh, the attacks. This is basically trying to leverage the emotional uh, activities that or the emotional uh, engagement that the, uh, people have with COVID-19, wanting to know what's happening with the, with the vaccine, what are the numbers today. So they try to leverage that emotion uh, to actually provoke active action from the, from the individuals in order for them to succeed in their attack. 
Alhamdulillah, I've been very successful in identifying these ahead of times and uh, addressing them. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, obviously. Um, like you said, cyber attacks are quite opportunistic. So, you know, this, this presented a big opportunity for them. Um, now, you've mentioned a little bit about the shift in um, kind of the cybersecurity focus or the cyber attack focus. Um, but has the pandemic changed your security strategy at all? Uh, By its nature, a strategy should always be able to adapt whenever there is something uh, disruptive occur. Cybersecurity is not a stranger to this as a, as a strategy process. And um, I know it's difficult for anyone right now to think about 2021 or because there's so much uncertainty, but um, can you tell me, you know, what are your security priorities looking ahead to the next year? Well, I think uh, our security priority is probably the security priority of every chief information security officer today, which is basically to enable a secure digital transformation. And this is something that uh, we are currently partnering with the Digital Transformation Office, as well as information technology and the business to ensure that the company uh, adopts a very secure digital transformation in order for us to reap the benefits of uh, the digital transformation without actually falling in any of the risks. So that's actually one of the priorities that, that we have. We will continue uh, to focus on uh, improving our detection and response capability to instill cyber resiliency within the organization. This is something that we feel is a pillar in what we have. So that's something that will always be on our radar is uh, improving detection and, and response. And the third item I think I just uh, shared uh, briefly, which is basically focusing on our user base, uh, the cybersecurity awareness and training. This is, will always remain uh, a priority to us and will continue to be for the next uh, few years. Now, what are the biggest challenges with cybersecurity um, for Saudi Aramco? I mean, I've mentioned this before, it's a huge company um, I've been to the headquarters myself. It's vast, the number of employees, the number of physical assets, the number of digital assets and the way they converge. Um, so what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in terms of cybersecurity? Uh, as, as you mentioned, right now we are seeing an, an increase in connectivity uh, due to the digital transformation. And one of the foundation of cybersecurity is actually uh, asset management. Uh, the second aspect, I think the digital transformation is also merging uh, the, the physical and the digital world together, uh, which introduces new risk, the risks that are pertaining to safety. So this actually, uh, again, needs to uh, go in a, in a very structured way, ensuring that all uh, the cybersecurity policies and standards are in place and effective, and the risks are managed as we continue to deploy solutions to leverage uh, the transformation. So as, 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 as I can say, I think this is, these are the, probably the, the two biggest challenges right now. And I believe that we have uh, what it takes to address them, inshallah. Um, so obviously we covered kind of the challenges or you know, the hurdles for cybersecurity, but uh, where do you see the most potential for growth in the cybersecurity space for oil and gas? For oil and gas, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, if I look at what's happening, we, we are actually seeing a, a huge explosion of uh, conductivity and data. And this is gonna be putting a lot of burden on the cybersecurity organizations to actually go through this data. So uh, there is definitely a, a room for growth for uh, automation and orchestration. Uh, it's currently happening, but I think we are going to be seeing an increase in uh, automation and orchestration to, to give the security analysts to focus on the items that are uh, important and let uh, the systems or the machines actually run the processes that are low level. The second aspect also is even with automation and or orchestration, the data is still huge. Uh, and uh, cybersecurity needs to actually even transform to face this. So, uh, technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning are, play, uh, are going to play a major role in helping our organization be able to detect and respond to attacks because uh, no human being can actually go and sift through all of this data 
to identify what is the threat. So there is going to be an increase and in growth uh, of dependency on artificial intelligence as well as machine learning. Yeah, and that seems to be a trend across the board. Um, now, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, obviously. Um, could you just explain in a little more detail um, how, how do you automate cybersecurity uh, functions? So what does that really mean? Uh, for example, there are certain uh, uh, capabilities like, uh, like uh, generating reports or analyzing uh, certain events. C certain practices uh, require the analyst to actually go through it to, uh, to say, yeah, this is a threat or not. These functions can be automated with a high degree of confidence. Other aspects is the, the delivery or the provisioning of uh, cybersecurity services, like identity access management. Uh, you don't need a system administrator behind the desktop to give people access. You can actually begin automating such uh, functions. So you're even digitally transforming cybersecurity itself? It has to, otherwise it will not be able to cope up with what's happening around us. That's fascinating. Um, so when we look at cybersecurity, um, what are some of the most common misunderstandings in the industry when it comes to, you know, information security? I think I'm going to say maybe there are currently maybe three misconceptions about cybersecurity, generally speaking. The first one uh, is that they often look at cybersecurity as, as a state, binary. It's either zero and one. You're either secure or non-secure, which is not truly the case. It's, uh, it needs to be viewed from a risk perspective and at what level the risk is treated and what residual risk is there that you are willing to accept. So the reality, it's not a state, it's not a zero and one. There is a lot of variable numbers between them. That's the, the first uh, misconception. The other is that cybersecurity is usually uh, viewed as an overhead or as a roadblock for enabling services. And in reality, it could be if cybersecurity is not involved at the earliest stage. Cybersecurity needs to be built in. Uh, it, it's not uh, effective if it's uh, an afterthought. If cybersecurity is an afterthought, then it is usually uh, a hurdle because again, you, you, you forgot security controls and now we have to mandate them. So in order for cybersecurity not to be uh, an, an overhead or a roadblock, they need to be involved at the earliest stage possible with every project. And the third misconception is that uh, that cybersecurity is technology intensive. And it is true that cybersecurity depends heavily on technology, but cybersecurity is human capital intensive. It actually requires uh, very selective and very uh, capable employees to actually run the show at the end of the day. So the majority of the investment should not be only focused on technology, it actually should be on the development of your employees who are at the end of the day will make technology effective and will optimize any process that we have. But in maybe in a nutshell, I'd say these are the three main misconceptions of cybersecurity. Um, I'd like to touch upon the second point that you made, which is, um, you know, you, you did mention how, you know, you should implement or involve cybersecurity in your planning at the earliest possible phase. It's, it's an interesting point. It definitely makes sense. Um, do you think, that's something that is happening in the oil and gas industry in general, not talking about Saudi Aramco, but in general, do you think oil and gas companies um, start why, by thinking about cybersecurity as a priority? I believe uh, the oil and gas industry views cybersecurity under safety. And uh, the practices of uh, the oil and gas when it comes to safety is that it is a very uh, important value that we stand by. So based on the benchmarkings that we've done with the organizers, I believe that practice is in place. Uh, it's whenever something transitions and makes a change. For example, the digital transformation right now is a completely different beast. Uh, and uh, a lot of organizations want to leverage the value immediately. They might forget to include cybersecurity. So maybe this is uh, for everybody as a general statement that you need to be even involved in cybersecurity in our case, for example, we are involved at the use case development, not even the design. So we are prepared when a design is there. Yeah, and um, so as a whole, because since we're making a general statement about the oil and gas industry, um, you know, is the industry mature in terms of its understanding and its implementation of cybersecurity measures? 
you know, where are we, um, you know, in the, the stages of development towards being, you know, as cyber secure as possible? I, I believe that generally speaking, uh, the, uh, there is a great understanding of cyber risk in the oil and gas. Uh, and it is uh, brought up the attention and the agenda of president and CEO of the oil and gas, even the chairmen. However, uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't challenges that uh, the oil and gas is facing. There are definitely challenging challenges in, for example, in the industrial control system, which is basically uh, the OT, the operation technology environment. It is lagging as compared to the IT domain, which is a challenge that I believe the oil and gas actually are uh, addressing as a collaborative uh, union. Uh, we do a lot of uh, exercises in collaboration with other oil and gas uh, organizations. Uh, Saudi Aramco, for example, is also championing uh, cyber resilience in the oil and gas with the World Economic Forum. And we have our partners also participating in the development of the program. So uh, I, I truly believe that it, it is uh, understood what cyber risk is. It is on the agenda of the president and CEOs. Uh, and they are uh, tackling it through collaborations. Um, I, I do find that an interesting point that, you know, we do look to third parties or, you know, experts to help uh, with cybersecurity measures. I'm curious to see, do you think that um, cybersecurity will become more of an internal function in the future, or do you think we'll continue to need those third party experts to help guide cybersecurity strategy? No, I think cybersecurity is cannot be done in isolation. There is always, always a need to collaborate and exchange information and share and learn from others and help others uh, better improve. Uh, and that, the reason behind it is that we don't operate as an island. We are uh, connected with our suppliers, with our partners. This connectivity requires that we collaborate at the challenges that we face together. And cybersecurity is actually one of them. Uh, any organization that believes that they don't need anybody to secure themselves, I personally believe that they are setting themselves to fail. Uh, collaboration is a must in this field. Otherwise, it's going to be a nightmare, and uh, I hope that nobody faces that nightmare. Yeah, I just, I, I do agree. And that's something, a common theme in the oil and gas industry, no matter what you're talking about, it's always about collaboration. It's definitely not an isolationist uh industry whatsoever yeah. um i do want to elaborate a little bit on that because it does also present some risks right that increased collaboration that um, a third party might bring something in or if they are not secure um, that might be a problem as well so um how can operators kind of tackle that added risk well in cyber security there is a domain called supply chain cyber security management so it is necessarily that as an operator or as an organization, generally speaking, that you identify the risk that your suppliers or third party uh, pose to you uh, and uh, develop whatever uh, framework or cybersecurity controls that are needed to ensure that the risk is actually mitigated. And this is what we are uh, doing. And uh, for example, we established a cybersecurity uh, program and uh, I'm happy to say that it actually was recognized by the CS050 uh, award uh, and it will be recognized in no November next, next uh, this year actually. So it is a challenge, it is a risk, but there is a program that addresses such risk. Uh, the, the assumption that uh, my security ends at my perimeter uh, is, is a very wrong assumption. You have to go and beyond that, you have to extend support to even your suppliers who are struggling and for example one of the things that we do in Saudi Aramco here is that we hold an annual uh, cyber security seminar for our suppliers to come and learn about cyber security so we we do a survey understand what are their challenges and then develop a seminar a technical workshop uh, that they are welcome to uh, to join and we share with them best practices in this area and we also link them with the cyber security service provide them to help them further with this uh, we are we firmly believe that this is something that uh, is a must and uh, we are definitely addressing it in Saudi Arabia. I want to go back to something that you had mentioned earlier. You had been talking about the next steps for cybersecurity in terms of automation, machine learning, and, it, you know, kind of making it uh, a little more autonomous, I guess. 
Um, where are we in that process? Is that something that's already being implemented? Are we close to that? Um, is it something that's recognized across the industry? So where are we in that process of moving towards? Um, we are talking about, uh, for example, we talk about orchestration automation, and that's been there for a very long time. It's just we are seeing more organizations leverage uh, orchestration and automation even further. When it comes to machine learning or artificial intelligence, I think there's been uh, very successful uses of it, but I believe we are just starting. I don't think we are there yet. It's going to take some time, and it's going to take actually a lot of collaboration because you could do a machine learning uh, model at an organization that would be beneficial to others. So from a machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence aspect in the field of cybersecurity, I believe we are just starting, but I think it's going to continue to grow because there is definitely a great value in it. Okay, well, I believe that's all the time that we have, but um, thank you so much for sharing your insight with me, uh, Khaled. Uh, I mean, we truly, we have so much to learn as we continue to digitalize and as cyber threats and cybersecurity strategies change over time. So thank you very much for joining me um, in this discussion. Um, our next session is going to examine the future of the industry in a more existential light with the world transitioning to lower carbon sources of energy. Where does oil and gas fit in? Find out after a short break. In our final panel of the day, we are going to explore the role of oil and gas companies as the world moves towards a lower carbon future. We're going to look at the measures that oil producers are currently taking and what must be done to tread the line between profitability and responsibility to remain relevant in a vastly different future. We have with us a panel of experts to discuss this most vital topic. Uh, with us today is ADNOC's Vice President of Sustainability, Samar El Hamidi, McDermott's Global Vice President of Strategy, Risk and Sustainability, Matthew Harwood, and Liv Hovem, who is the CEO of DNVGL's Oil and Gas Division. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am really looking forward to this conversation. And uh, let's just dive right in. So um, I think I'm actually, I'll start with Liv. Um, from a general perspective, where are we heading in terms of the energy transition? So, you know, what are the key trends that we're seeing in the oil and gas industry and what are the next steps? Yeah, thank you. This is a good question. And uh, we have studied that and released a report recently on the energy transition outlook uh, just a month ago, the last uh, version of that. And uh, what we see is that we are approaching a future uh, where the world will need less energy even if the global population increases and the global economy continues to grow. Um, we predict that in uh, 2032 uh, is when the energy use will peak and that from there on uh, humanity will start to consume less energy. Uh, and the reason we forecast this is mainly due to the large energy efficiency improvements in all sectors, uh, which uh, is accelerated by um, electrification and the electricity is uh, dominated by renewables. So uh, electricity demand will more than double over the next 30 years. And we see that the supply of uh, solar PV will grow 20 fold and uh, wind growing 10 fold. Um, if you look at the oil and gas and the share of uh, fossil fuels in the world's energy mix, this will decrease from uh, 80% where it is today to roughly half in 2050. We forecast that the uh, demand for oil has uh, actually passed and that gas will overtake oil as the world, uh, world's largest energy source uh, by the mid 2020s already. Um, but we also see that uh, the gas, the natural gas will begin to be decarbonized at scale from the middle of next decade. Uh, even though uh, this is quite a dramatic uh, shift um, and there is a significant uh, 
uh, effort of electrification and decarbonization, uh, it is not enough to deliver on the Paris Agreement. Uh, our forecast tells us that we will exhaust the 1.5 degree um, carbon budget by 2028 and the 2 degree carbon budget by 2051. So that again tells us that even though uh, there is a rapid energy transition happening, we have to accelerate even more. Um, in currency, in currency enough, we have the, the, hardware, the, the hardware technology to reach these uh, targets. We have, I mentioned, electrification, um, renewables, batteries, uh, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Uh, but the, the, the key now is to, to scale all this sooner than is currently uh, happening. Yeah, so I mean, clearly there's a lot that needs to happen and your forecast, you know, is uh, there's going to be a lot of transitioning happening in the very near future. And it's interesting, I mean, you brought up peak oil. I mean, even OPEC is acknowledging peak oil by you know, around 2040 to 2045, which is not far off from your own uh, mm -hmm. forecast. So, I mean, it's it, it'll definitely be an interesting uh, period in the next, um, you know, in the next uh, few decades. Um, Samad, I'd like to hear your perspective. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on, you know, the key trends and the next steps in the energy transition? Thank you, Carla. Um, um, I, do, um, I do see the challenge here for oil and gas companies. Obviously, the energy transition does raise some existential questions for the oil and gas industry. And the biggest challenge we have is how we can manage, uh, you know, shifting a strategic landscape while maintaining our commitments, obviously, to, to our customers and our, our shareholders and our stakeholders in general. And how, but more importantly, how we can find a way to play a leading, a leading role in the decarbonization story, right? So we've seen a number of uh, major players in the oil and gas industry respond to this with a number of strategies and ambitious commitments to lower emissions and achieve net zero. So for, for IOCs versus NOCs, it's different challenges, different uh, perspectives on, on how they can address that. When you look at the NOCs and, um, you know, they, they steward the, the, um, um, the national hydrocarbon reserves and they contribute significantly to the, um, to the uh, governments or the, the nations that they belong to. Um, so for, for, for an NOC, for example, like an ADNOC, uh, a challenge is how do we maintain um, our position as a responsible and sustainable oil and gas producer in, in view of this dynamic energy landscape while maintaining our commitment to, to support the, uh, the UAE's uh, national goals and uh, uh, economy as well. Um, and can you just, for the audience, I mean, what are the UAE national goals? in terms of sustainability and transitioning towards lower carbon? So in terms of, uh, I could probably shed some more light as well on the ADNOC strategic goals, uh, you know, for the viewers who, um, you know, are not aware of the strategy that we launched in um, uh, earlier of 2020. We've uh, built on our legacy as a sustainable oil and gas producer um, and, and the history of achievements uh, in sustainability. So we've put a number of strategic pillars that span climate change and energy, um, uh, you know, protecting and preserving the local environment, uh, workforce diversity and HSE. Um, and under each of these pillars, we've put ambitious targets and goals um, to, uh, to achieve our, our 2030 strategy. Uh, one being a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 25%. Uh, so that's GHG intensity uh, by 2030. Um, maintain a freshwater consumption uh, below 0.5% again by 2030. Uh, looking at how we can scale up our CCUS um, um, as well by, by six times. So our current capacity now is at 800,000 tons capture a capacity of CO2, which is done in partnership with Emirates Steel. And we're looking inwards within ADNOC as well and, and how we can scale up CCUS, look at potential sources of, of capture uh, within ADNOC. Um, and uh, coupled with that as well, uh, we will capitalize on the achievements we've done on energy efficiency. That's been the, the, the biggest contributor to our efforts so far. Uh, maintain our zero flaring routine um, 
zero routine flaring uh, policy in, in our activities and operations. So we're proud of these achievements and the challenge is, is how we can um, you know, propel that forward uh, to, to look at how we can meet the climate change challenges, support the UAE in, in the commitments that they've made um, in terms of, um, you know, a cleaner energy mix for all of UAE and how we can effectively contribute to that. Yeah, I mean, I especially I, the point between, you know, an IOC and an NOC, the priorities are definitely different and the responsibility is definitely different. So I think that's an, a very interesting point. Um, uh, Matthew, just moving on to you, I'd like to hear your thoughts, uh, I guess, from the EPC perspective, what are the key trends that you're seeing um, and what are the next steps uh, when we're moving towards this energy transition? Uh, thanks, Carla, and uh, thank you very much for having us on the, on the panel today. Um, uh, we are um, also tracking the, uh, the challenges of the energy transition very, very closely. Um, we work for clients across the world globally. And um, actually, it's interesting to hear um, uh, Liv's uh, scenario about how the energy transition might unfold. I mean, what we're seeing from a variety of different sources is actually quite a wide range of potential outcomes. And probably in my career in the oil and gas industry of 25 years, it's probably the greatest level of uncertainty, I would say, about how the energy mix might unfold. You know, we're seeing anything, you know, anything, for example, for peak oil being, as you said, from OPEC perhaps post-2040 to others saying that we've already had peak oil uh, and really radically different uh, trajectories uh, going forward, depending on not in short term the impact of the, uh, the virus and the economy, but to longer term on the speed of the energy transition. Um, I think what's probably true to say in, in that energy transition is that um, hydrocarbons will continue to play an important role um, supporting in, in petrochemicals and transportation um, uh, for many years to come. And, um, and it's certainly clear that uh, the um, uh, oil and gas companies in the Middle East will have a very, very important role to play in, in that as some of the lowest cost production that we have in, in hydrocarbons uh, uh, globally. And, um, one of one of the uh, one of the aspects that that I'm very interested in as a as a contractor is how do we support our clients like Adnoc um, in in uh, continuing to develop their core uh, operations in a more sustainable way. So looking at how we contribute to the uh, carbon footprint of our clients, whether it's uh, you know in the supply chain, the way we engineer and, and design and build facilities the way uh, Brazil uh, facilities are designed to run to minimize uh, emissions, et cetera. So, so clear, I think oil and gas does have a role to play for a long time, but we need to do more work to make it more sustainable. Um, and then clearly also, uh, as uh, Liv said, there the are gonna be uh, massive increases in investment in new technologies, uh, such as uh, solar and wind and hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. And the sort of second part of our activity is really to, to start to, to figure out how we can help our clients uh, as they invest in those technologies to help um, bring those new technologies to the market and, and to help scale them um, because it's achieving scale and uh, cost competitiveness, which I think is critical uh, in uh, navigating this, uh, this energy transition. Now, to take it back to you, Samar, um, you've already touched a little bit on this, but I'd like you to elaborate. So from within an NOC, um, what are the top priorities right now um, in terms of pushing for lower emissions within ADNOC and kind of increasing the focus on sustainability? Um, so I guess maybe to just build on to what Matthew just said, um, it's it's going to take a lot of R and D and and innovation in, in new technologies for us to to you know propel our decarbonization uh, targets forward. Uh, so to meet our twenty five percent GHG intensity, we're looking at different different levers of technology. Uh, you know, be it energy efficiency, scaling up our CCUS. Uh, but there is, it's a moving target, if you will. So we need to look at how we can, uh, you know, take this one step further. What kind of technologies and solutions do we look at, you know, beyond CCUS, you know, like low carbon hydrogen, 
uh, at the end it has to make business sense uh, to Adnoc, but as well uh, still maintain our, our position and our commitment to being a responsible oil and gas producer. Um, so the sustainability function in Adnoc is placed under the technology group for that very same reason. Um, so when we're looking at the climate change aspects and you know what kind of solutions and technologies that we need to consider, that's where the R&D um, capabilities and the digital capabilities of the technology group um, are, are harmonized with the sustainability mandates. So looking at capitalizing on the digital infrastructure we built, looking at how we can uh, further optimize our activities and operations. Um, we have our Panorama Digital Command Center where we have an end-to-end -end accountability over hydrocarbon streams, which means we can track um, you know, our activities and operations and identify where we can optimize across our value chain. Um, we're looking as well in terms of scaling up um, you know, our, our CCUS technologies, leveraging partnerships and collaborations with you know, industry peers, technology providers and academia to look at how we can make that um, technology, you know, whether it's CCUS or, or, or other low carbon technologies, more commercial uh, and um, something that we can deploy at scale. And I think that's a lot of the challenges that we're facing now. Um, you know, there are technologies available today that are um, you know, fit for deployment, um, but there are others that need further R&D uh, and uh, more research to, to look at how we can uh, capitalize on those further. Um, and so Matthew, from your perspective, I mean, we've talked about this before in a previous interview for oil and gas Middle East. I mean, what's interesting for a contractor is there's different layers. I mean, there's partnership with oil companies, and then there's also the internal uh, sustainability measures for an EPC company. So um, can you tell me a little bit about the priorities for uh, McDermott when you are pushing for lower emissions across the board? Yeah, that's right, Carla. And yeah, we, we really um, ta tackle this in, I think, in, in, in two pieces. The first is, you know, what we are doing internally in, a, in our own operations. And then secondly, what can we do support some of those ne next technologies that uh, Samar was just talking about. Um, and if I just quickly touch on both of those uh, pieces, um, we recognize that um, as an EPC contractor, our carbon footprint or greenhouse gas footprint is part of the scope three emissions of our clients. And so the first thing that we need to do is really get control of that, understand um, you know, what, what our own greenhouse gas footprint is both in our own owned activities, but also in our supply chain. And we're doing a lot of work uh, really right now to, to establish all of the, the, the tracking systems so that we can track our greenhouse gas emissions um, um, right across our operations, right down at the kind of uh, the project level. Um, for us, a lot of the emissions come from things like uh, fabrication yards. Um, uh, we have one just down the road from where you guys are in Jebel Ali. For example, um, and um, we have um, const marine construction assets which uh, consume a lot of marine uh, marine fuels, um, and of course we um, we have our construction sites themselves, the onshore construction sites which uh, use diesel in, in their operations. And so, really getting a handle on on our own operations and, uh, and driving initiatives um, to reduce those uh, those uh, those emissions as one part of it. I think the sec second part of that first section is is really how do we design and build facilities with a you know, the lower life cycle greenhouse gas um, uh, footprint? And we're doing a lot of work which we call facility of the future, which is how how do you build um, the today's technology, so today's facilities, but in a, in a, a much more sustainable way, um, and where we can uh, we can actually show different options to our clients to say, well, if you know if you want to take you know, capex carbon out of the facility or opex carbon out of the facility. These are the options that we can look at. Um, and then I think, yeah, moving to the new technologies, um, we, we are looking at all of the technologies that uh, Car Carla mentioned, at hydrogen, at um, um, carbon capture and storage, and, and a few more besides, including energy storage, sort of grid energy storage. Um, and, and really our focus as an EPC contractor is how do we leverage our international um, supply chain, our fabrication capabilities, 
to be able to scale up these technologies and, 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 bring, and through that scale up and the access to the international supply chain, bring down their costs, which, which you know, as Carla mentions, we need to do to make these technologies uh, competitive. So those are the, our two areas of focus, greening our own operations and, and supporting our clients as they move into new technologies at scale. Um, Liv, so obviously you don't operate within a producer or an EPC company. Your scope is a little bit different, but do you have anything to add in terms of maybe a broader overview of the priorities in the industry in terms of pushing towards lower emissions? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, we heard what uh, Samir and Matthew say, and it really, uh, it's very much aligned with the, with our research and the study. It's, uh, it's approximately 15% of the global energy related greenhouse gases comes from the process of getting the oil and gas out of the ground and to consumers. And of course, to work on reducing that is important. And uh, Samara already mentioned about uh, reducing emission, uh, detecting methane leaks, and also the efficiencies in the, in the supply chains and the value chains. And then in the longer run, it's more about uh, carbon capture and, and hydrogen. So yeah, m very much uh, aligned thinking there. Yeah, and I mean, so the common thread obviously is, you know, we're not seeing oil and gas disappearing. It's still going to have a role. The role is just going to change and it might be a drastic change, but, you know, it still does have a role. So um, what I'd like to know um, is, I mean, what are some of the major misunderstandings about the role, role of oil and gas in the energy transition? Um, I think I'd like to start with Samar on this one. So, um, you know, what are some of the misunderstandings that you've seen about oil and gas in the energy transition? Um, I guess I'll, I'll touch upon the, the earlier point made um, in terms of where we see the, the peak demand going and what that future entails for, for oil and gas companies. Um, now, as you rightly said, um, and I tend to agree with Matthew here, I, I don't there's still demand for, for oil and gas in, in the coming decades to meet, uh, you know, growing global population and, you know, provide um, affordable and, and reliable energy supply, especially in, in developing areas of the world. And I think when we look at the energy transition and what it implies for the oil and gas is um, oil and gas being perceived as part of the problem but they could also be very instrumental players in, in solving it. Um, so as we continue to provide that um, energy supply to the world, we need to look at how we can do that responsibly. Now, obviously, there is no silver bullet to, to fix the problem. I mean, we all wish we'd have an infinite supply of energy with, with low carbon emissions, but um, the takeaway here is for oil and gas companies to look at how they can contribute uh, to the energy transition, how they can transform their business model, be more resilient and adaptive to meet uh, both their commitments to the stakeholders, you know, whether you're an IOC or an NLC, but also look at how they can um, you know, protect the environment. Uh, how can they, they play a role in, in the decarbonization story? So, um, adaptation here is key, and I think it's pretty much reflected in a lot of the uh, commitments and strategies that you're seeing coming out to the uh, major oil and gas players. So the recognition is there, and I think um, the um, the next you know uh, time, I mean, period is, is going to be critical for you know what direction uh, each oil and gas company takes to be part of that. I can just come in and add something to what Samar said because, you know, I, I, I totally agree w with what you're saying, Samar. I think the, um, the oil and gas community has some, well, a number of capable capabilities which, you know, in some ways are unparalleled um, globally. And, and if they're harnessed as part of the en en energy transition could be, as you say, a part of the solution. So. So the ability to deliver very, very large scale, um, complex infrastructure projects globally, um, the very, very few organizations that have the capability to, to, you know, to build um, you know, infrastructure at massive scale, you know, whether it's oil and gas or low carbon renewables and reaching around the globe. Um, 
and uh, just to have that network that capability that experience um uh, is you know is something that we need to harness in this energy transition and and there are two i think very specific capabilities the oil and gas community has that doesn't really doesn't exist anywhere else the first is the ability to to operate offshore you know i think our utilities have started to well, off offshore wind near shore but really the capabilities to 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 deliver projects you know very remotely offshore wind projects harnessing wind you know strong wind uh, resources way offshore is really something that i see the oil and gas community having a strong role to play in and secondly subsurface right you know reservoirs which are you know and aquifers which could be fantastic stores of co2 in the future you know who understands those well it's the oil and gas company so you know i think there's three reasons there why why there's a you know there's a really really strong role for the oil and gas companies as part of this transition um you know i think both in terms of scale and reach but also in terms of technical competence yeah uh live your take yeah no i i really support this uh, for uh, all the reasons that has been mentioned but i think the biggest misunderstanding is uh, that there that the oil and gas will not be there in the future but there will be a lot of oil and gas uh, as i said uh, initially it will be almost half of the energy system uh, half of the energy sources uh, so that's a big misunderstanding and um, and also uh, in order to uh, reach the climate goals we actually have to work on that part of the of the coin to to decarbonize that part of the energy system and i think the oil and gas industry uh, is really the the one capable for that and then as matthew said there is an element of not in my backyard uh, related to energy infrastructure and i'm quite certain that more and more of that will go far offshore uh, and that is where the industry really have uh, capabilities to to deliver on um, and of course not to mention the the storage of uh, of carbon so uh, yeah i think we need to get our story right so that uh, we are uh, seen as an attractive and important uh, um, player in solving this problem yeah so i'm actually i think I'm, i'll stay with you on this live just touching on that last point you know we we need to get our story straight um, so, I mean, what is the right role then for oil and gas companies when we're looking at the global effort to, you know, reduce emissions, to battle climate change? What is our responsibility? What is the role of oil and gas in that fight? Well, I, I think that, um, that uh, many of the oil and gas companies uh, do uh, the right things, set up very ambitious targets. Um, but of course now it's the, they will be, you know, followed very closely to, to see that they deliver on these targets. Um, and I guess the biggest challenge is actually the scope three emissions, right? How do, how do they tackle that? Uh, but I see now that there are, uh, I mean, new partnerships evolving. Of course, one thing is that they are diversifying into these um, renewable energy systems. But it's also, um, it's also the element of becoming the, um, uh, more the energy provider than the oil and gas producer. Uh, which uh, then will um, will give uh, very new uh, business models uh, to cities and uh, municipalities. So it will be interesting to follow exactly that uh, scope three uh, emission target and how that uh, develops going forward. Uh, Samad, if I could just jump to you to hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, what is the royal role of oil and gas companies in the energy transition and in fighting uh, you know, climate change. Um, so I think I've, I've touched on on, the, on those points, uh, Carla. But uh, maybe I can just kind of recap again. Where, where it's it's the it's understanding the um, the organization's footprint in terms of carbon emissions, right? So um, you know, internally look at how you can decarbonize your operations and activities. Uh, look at how you can. Um, you know, balance that with your, with your, with the strategic commitments that the um, company has, you know, to different stakeholder groups. Uh, but more importantly as well is uh, go beyond that and explore partnerships, you know, with, with different industries, with different stakeholders, even with, with the governments as well to look at how um, they can capitalize on the oil and gas capabilities and the know-how 
to to deploy you know you know typically capital intensive um, you know technologies um, and I think that that's a point that Matthew made earlier on is um, you know the infrastructure and and that technical competencies and capabilities and skills uh, are very much um, uh, within the oil and gas industry and that gives a, a huge opportunity for for different stakeholders to actually come together and look at how uh, they can uh, be part of a bigger decarbonization picture uh matthew anything to add i think that i'll just add one thing which is you know, I, read, I was reading in the, uh, in the in the newspaper last week. Uh, the CEO of, of Glencore had said something interesting about coal assets. He basically said, Look, "There's no point me divesting my my coal assets if I'm simply going to divest them to somebody who's going to run them in a less sustainable way." And and I think there's you know there's a we all know the oil and gas companies. They've got strong brands. We know who they are. We know that they t take sustainability seriously. You know, I'd, I'd much rather that they were running you know our oil you know our oil and gas that we still need to have you know globally you know in a very you know, responsible and sustainable manner than that they were for example divested went into the hands of potentially nefarious you know owners who would have less um, perhaps uh, you know you know ambitious goals around operating sustainably so i think you know the, these these companies are going to be the responsible custodians of this important resource that we that we have you know, for many decades to come. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, certainly I see my role in the supply chain to support them and in making those um, uh, resources as sustainable as possible um, while affecting this energy transition to new forms of energy. Um, and um, I will just make one further point, which is often missed, which is, you know, oil and gas reservoirs don't just carry on having productive capacity. They, they decline. Uh, and so, you know, even if there was no further increase in demand in, in at all in in I have to invest and maintain the production capacities. So you know there is a there is going to be a need for new even 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 in a in a in a declining energy demand or hydrocarbon demand world, there still will be need to need to be a responsible investment to to maintain production capacity to 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 keep the lights on essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point that you make, especially about, you know, the companies that are already custodians of this industry. We're definitely seeing more investments into sustainability and kind of diversifying assets and I mean, it, both on the IOC and NOC level. So that's definitely um, an, an interesting point. Um, I, I would like to go back to something that you mentioned, Samad, which is an important point. You You mentioned that you know, you still have to balance between um, your commitments in terms of sustainability and, you know, good business sense. Um, can you tell me a bit about that challenge right now? Um, and, you know, do you expect a shift in that other uh, relationship between sustainability and business sense in the future? Um, so if I put that um, in the context of ADNOC, um, it's uh, when we talk about sustainability and business, that's that's pretty much uh, something that we address hand in hand. It's integrated in the way we do business, in the way we make decisions. And mostly that's because um, uh, the driver has been always through through the founding father of the UAE, Sheikh Zayed, um, instilling these principles of sustainability and, and how we can protect and preserve our natural resources. So it is, I would not say these are, you know, particularly challenging priorities. Um, um, as I said, it's, it's how we can continue to be a, a major driver uh, to the UAE's economy and, and maintain that commitment that we've, we've, we have with different stakeholders while maintaining our position as a sustainable uh, oil and gas producer and maintaining sustainability commitments. So what it comes down to basically is in our strategic decisions and in, in how we decide to move forward as an organization, we look at the impacts um, on, um, on our responsibilities and our commitments for sustainability. Uh, and how we can continue to meet those goals while delivering value for our stakeholders. 
Um, and live. So from kind of the broader perspective, um, internationally or globally, um, is this a challenge that we're seeing, um, you know, across oil and gas companies? Uh, yeah, I, obviously, this is a, a challenge uh, for um, many companies, I think. But it's also important to, um, to see that the, it is, I mean, the growing awareness of the urgency and the magnitude of the climate change uh, is increasing and it increases the pressure on the oil and gas industry to decarbonize. Um, I mentioned uh, that the industry needs to be attractive, uh, not only for talents, but also for uh, investors. So I think it is a kind of a longer term success factor for the sector that, uh, that it is proactive and tries to be a part of the solutions rather to reacting on other, uh, other um, stakeholders pressure. And society pressure. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, do you have anything to add um, from the EPC yeah. side? Well, I think what I what I would say is that um, um, while you may, you may worry uh, as an oil and gas company about the impact of getting involved in sustainability or energy transition on your on, on your profitability, I think you have you know there's two things working with you as you make the transition. The first is that um, typically low carbon projects and particularly renewables have lower risk than oil and gas. So there's a lot of risk in oil and gas because you know it's a highly uncertain activity. You're drilling exploration wells, you don't know whether or not you're gonna find resources, et cetera. And so um, consequently, um, oil and gas companies have had a very, very um, high cost of capital, um, haven't had much Essentially, and much debt in in their in their uh, in their businesses. I think as they move into lower risk technologies, there's an opportunity to change in a way change their capital structure to take on more debt to have a more efficient balance balance sheet and a lower cost of capital. And that's a big transition to make. But this it, it is something that as as the, the percentage of renewables goes up in the oil companies' portfolio, they can actually start to shift the way that they structure their balance sheets. And I think secondly, and perhaps more importantly. The investor appetite for low carbon investments is enormous. So you know, you know what you can see is companies that have a higher component of green or energy transition technologies within them will enjoy a, a better rating in the market, a better valuation in the market. So, so, um, so while you you know you may may have to you know suffer for a short period lower lower profits, they will be valued more highly in the market because they. Uh, is an anticipation of a huge growth potential. So I think two things working in your favor as you, as you wrestle with this, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, this balance. So, I mean, we've already, we've, we've been talking in kind of a positive light about, um, you know, the role of oil and gas and how it can contribute positively towards the energy transition. Uh, but what are some of the major challenges when we're looking at oil and gas moving towards a lower carbon future, you know, and probably increase uncertainty in that future. Um, so what are some of the major challenges? Liv, I'd like to start with you and um, we'll move from there. I think we touched upon some of them, but I, I think uh, one of the major challenges is the, um, is the big uncertainty, what, what to plan for, what to uh, invest in. Um, wh where are we moving? How is the technology moving? What regulations will be um, imposed uh, on us? I think uh, the uncertainty is um, is great, uh, and that means uh, the business have to run to to manage that uncertainty. Um, but uh, if more tangible thing, I think the, um, the scope three emissions really to be part of uh, of uh, reducing scope three uh, will be a challenge for oil and gas industry. And uh, and um, but maybe the kind of the the most um, most important now is not to be uh, regarded as a sunset industry, right? To keep but to keep uh, keeping you know modern in the minds of young people and uh, investors who use the right technology be perceived as a as a positive force. Uh, that is um, that will be a challenge because there are very many critical voices out there. Uh, Matthew, can I have your take? So what are some of the challenges? Um, and since obviously you're working in an 
oil and gas company as an EPC company specifically, what are the challenges that you're facing? Well, um, I must say, I was, I was going to cut it two ways. Firstly, talk about the, the, the challenges of the industry and then within, the, within McDermott. I think for the industry as a whole um, to, to affect this change, I mean, I noted down three things. Um, one is, is around cost um, and the cost of these alternative energies, low carbon energies. It, it is still higher than the traditional sources of energy. And, and, and so that we need to ensure that somehow the price of carbon, the price of the cost of, of greenhouse gas emissions is, is effectively worked into market so that, that we can kind of, you know, the, the low carbon heat. Um, I think, you know, the second one I was going to say was customer acceptance, um, you know, wherever it is, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, somebody getting used to, to using uh, uh, an electric vehicle and charging that or, or to having, a, you know, hydrogen blended into their natural gas that comes into their home or whatever. There's a, there's a lot of work to do on customer acceptance of some of the new technologies. Um, and I think one of the other one of the other points I was going to make on the energy transition was around um, volatility and uh, and uh, intermittency of of some of the renewable energy sources, and we need to to make sure that we have ways of dealing with that um, volatility and intermittency in our in our energy systems. Um, just in terms of the challenges um, internally for an, for example an EPC company to to, to really drive forward its sustainability and energy transition strategy. I would say not too many challenges. Once you've made the commitment to start thinking about this, the fact you get such a strong resonance with your customers and your shareholders and, and, and most importantly, as Liv was saying, with your, you know, with your employees, particularly the younger employees, I think it almost feels to me, and I'd be interested to see whether Samar has the same uh, feeling inside uh, Adnoc. It's, you just have to somehow catalyze the debate or, or the initiative. And then you just see this kind of upswelling of interest and activity and enthusiasm. And a lot of people giving you know, their own time to these initiatives um, almost outside of their day jobs because they want to personally uh, contribute and make progress. Um, so um, you know, what, I, I've, what I've seen in McDermott is actually, it's, it's, just, it's all it's been light, it's been like lighting a spark and just then all of the energy has kind of come out of the organization to, to start trying to address some of these challenges. And Asama, what your perspective from the NOC side? Um, I, I, I tend to agree with the, with, the, with the points that Liv and, and Matthew mentioned. And I mean, when it comes to the potential cost of, of these different abatements and, and decarbonization strategies, right? What does that mean for the organization's bottom line? Or, you know, what does the future look like for an organization? So you see a lot of um, oil and gas companies, uh, you know, divesting away from their core, core oil and gas business and, and moving into different um, energy landscapes. So, um, you know, if that makes business sense or not, uh, when we're looking at the cost of some of these uh, low carbon technologies, I think there's, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to make these commercially viable uh, so that they can be deployed at scale. Um, and when it comes to, uh, you know, Liv touched upon, you know, the, the um, kind of younger generation and, and Matthew touched upon the customers, I think the challenge here is we have a variety of stakeholder groups and uh, how we manage the perception of the, each of these groups um, is, um, it can be, can be a balance act, if you will, right? So we, so we have the pressure from the investors um, looking at, you know, how we can um, accelerate our efforts in terms of decarbonization, you know, what are we doing in terms of sustainability, in terms of, you know, how we um, uh, address the, the, uh, the, the climate change aspects. And then you have a younger generation who is equally um, kind of excited to see or, or you know, um, looking at how, how the organization is, is uh, demonstrate, demonstrating its commitment, right? So how are we translating these commitments to actions on the ground? Um, and then you have the pressures as well from uh, your, uh, you know, government, your customers to meet energy and, and supply and demand. So it's, it's a balance act, if you will, to look at how we can strategically um, harmonize all of these, uh, these perceptions and expectations from the oil and gas, but keeping the, the goal in mind at the end is 
how we can um, how we can adapt to this energy transition. And I guess maybe one point I can add to that, maybe looking at it from a different angle, is um, the opportunity here is is for the oil and gas companies. Um, obviously, doing nothing is not an option. Um, you know, oil and gas company, whether you're an IOC or an OC, recognizing that uh, you will be impacted by that energy transition, but then looking inward at how you can transform your business model, how you can maintain your resilience, given that this is a very changing and dynamic landscape. There's a lot of volatility, as Matthew mentioned. Um, you know, how can you um, kind of foresee these risks and how can you um, integrate that resilient and adaptive approach uh, looking at how we can ramp up research efforts, uh, looking at, you know, not just low carbon technologies, but focusing on other uses or non-combustion uses of, of hydrocarbons, which you know, takes us all to the to the uh, scope three space as well. So, yeah. So, you, you know, you did mention for the pressures and kind of conflicting pressures uh, from government, from stakeholders, from all of these different sources, and that brought to mind um, one topic that came up in our first panel of the day, which was about OPEC, um, something that a few of our speakers did mention was that the oil and gas industry may be unfairly scrutinized or overly scrutinized and that CO2 specifically is overly scrutinized as, um, you know, as a GHG, uh, where there are other sources that are maybe not being noticed as uh, intensely. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I think specifically live from kind of the research perspective and with this outlook that you um, you develop every year. Uh, do you think that's the case? What is your take? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, maybe right, maybe wrong, but I think uh, maybe it's forgotten uh, the positive uh, effect that natural gas has in the energy transition. So shifting from coal and partly oil over to gas, uh, the importance uh, it has to air pollution and air quality we've seen in, um, in, the, in the East. Uh, I think that's really a positive de development. Okay, so, um, so maybe realizing that uh, in the energy transition, maybe we're not able to solve all the problems in one, but have to go a little bit step by step and take um, take several transitions you now from coal to gas and then to, to hydrogen to electricity. So I, I think maybe that's also one of the um, uh, misperceptions that there is one big energy transition, but actually there are many transitions and, uh, and the, the uptake of especially natural gas is uh, important uh, with respect to air quality and then quality of life. Um, anything to add, uh, Matthew or Samar? I'll just say, I mean, just say that, um, you know, this is such a, this is such a, a big issue and with such potentially calamitous consequences, I, I, I think we do need to look at all of, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that oil and gas companies should hide from the challenge they're getting. In fact, I think it's good for us that we're getting this challenge. Um, but I do think we should look in, in, you know, in other areas. And I want personally that, you know, I'm always, you know, very, very kind of concerned about is how, you know, are things like deforestation and, you know, and, and, and you know, why, why, why we don't spend more time, you know, internationally talking about carbon sinks and, and how they're being, you know, they're being affected, for example, by forestation. Um, and, um, and actually, you know, just as a sidebar, I actually do think that it's quite interesting that, that oil and gas companies could have a role in, 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 in for, you know, afforestation projects because it, it lends itself to companies with big reach and, and the ability to organize projects over, you know, inter, international uh, 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 distances. But um, no, I, th I don't think we should hide from the challenge, but I think we also need to look as a, as a you know, as a global community into other areas as well where we can, we can help ourselves in this energy transition. Okay, well, I think that's all the time that we have. Uh, thank you all for joining me uh, for this discussion today. Obviously, this is a very big topic. This is a very big conversation. As some of you have noted, it's a moving target. It's gonna keep changing. The, I think for me, the key takeaway from this conversation is we are trying to contribute to that positive change. 
how we do that will continue to shift. Um, and truly, it will be fascinating to see how the energy transition intertwines with the oil and gas sector in the future. But for now, thank you for sharing your expertise on the subject. And thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today. Um, we will share your questions with our speakers. So make sure to check our website for the answers and to watch and share the panels uh, from today.